Okay, welcome back to another episode of the Regenerative Health Podcast. Today, I'm sitting down in person with regenerative farmer and regenerative farming advocate, Charlie Arnott. Charlie, thank you so much for coming on. Dr. Max, thanks for having me. This is actually, this is lovely because um, it's a role reversal. I don't maybe have to think quite so much. And sitting down here, I don't know if I've actually done a podcast um, uh, side by side, like in the style that I'm used to. So this is great. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, so so we've just spent an hour and a half uh, talking as part of your podcast. It's called The Regenerative Health Journey, uh, which is where you interview predominantly regenerative farmers uh, about their, their journey and their background. Um, my podcast, Regenerative Health, um, which is, again, emphasizing he- the health part of things. You're, um, you're like a lot of regenerative farmers, you came from a conventional agricultural background. And I think this transition is so instructive and, and it says a lot about a person, um, uh, whether that's a doctor who's gone from a conventional to a lifestyle approach or a farmer that's gone from conventional to a regenerative approach. It involves a massive amount of humbleness to, to really pivot in, 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 a way that, um, in, in a way that you have. So maybe just start at the beginning with about you, uh, your family and um, what, where you were um, perhaps when you made that, that change. Mm. Um, so I grew up on a farm, our family farm at um, Burrowa in uh, a few hours north of here, uh, New South Wales. Uh, conventional farming sits, uh, situation, we had lots of input, lots of output, sheep, cattle, crops, ha- cut hay. Um, over the years as I you know, um, grew up and um, through school and, uh, and so on, um, I didn't probably notice it, but I, when I think back, we was definitely using more chemical. Like There was a, a great usage or reliance on chemical. Um, and then after school and through university and when I came back to to manage the farm after a few years away um, uh, more and more more and more chemical use uh, as part of again a normal regime of growing crops mainly you know, a lot of chemical use in animals as well the drenching and and you know backlining which I guess is a, is a form of drenching and um, <clears throat> other um, animal husbandry uh, you know, inputs. Uh, but certainly in the cropping that we did, we there was a pretty solid uh, raft of um, a prescription, you know, um, application of herbicides, fungicides, and and and, and pesticides. Uh, so, but that aside, you know, I grew up on our farm, had a lovely time. It was just a wonderful place to to live and to grow up in, and in 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 nature. Which again, I wasn't really, you know, looking at it as nature. It was more of a it was a playground. You know, trees, grass, sheep, cattle, working hard, playing hard, um, and that's what I knew, and that's what Dad did, and that's was that was our farm life. Um, uh, you know, all the way through, even you know, holidays from school, I'd be you know helping Dad move cattle and sheep and all those things. So it was just normal, you know, farm life. And uh, and we talked in in the interview I just did with you there, Max, about you know what it is to be on a farm and kind of that touch with touch points with nature again I wasn't sort of thinking or wonderful how wonderful it is to be in nature but it was um just it was a it was a normal thing um I guess in 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 on reflection you know that was I guess somewhat tainted by a lot of our chemical use um uh I suspect that now and this is going but we stopped using chemical uh, 18 years ago probably Nearly nearly nine, nearly nine and years. In terms of like cropping and so on, we still use a little bit of, you know, drench and sheep, uh, and sometimes cattle, but very rarely now. It was more a function of the seasons we're having and the wet summers and you know, challenges and break and worm cycles and so on. But certainly, any you know, um, uh, plant chemicals and in pad- in paddock and pasture, trying to control weeds and things or thistles, so on. Um, we stopped doing that many years ago. So um, you know, um, now we 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 do things very differently. We not using that sort of um, um, herbicides and pesticides and and um, fungicide chemicals. We're um, farming biodynamically, so we we use biodynamic preparations and we teach other farmers how to use and, and make them themselves. Um, we graze holistically. I, I guess you know we 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 
where we we look at everything in a holistic farm management, um, uh, low stress stock handling. So we're much more, I guess, conscious of animal animal happiness and and performance and how we how we how we handle them, how we manage them, how we move them through paddocks. Um, the people side of it's probably you know more front of mind as well, and we're definitely more front of mind in terms of you know staff team team um is that this is moving yeah it? yeah pull it back yeah. it's not a ghost it's just a just a draft um the uh you know where where people i'll put that little thing brother yeah where people are up to with their um you know their happiness you know like we go just be more conscious of of the, i guess the culture in the business which is sometimes you know not not focused on or not really even acknowledged in, you know, certainly before we didn't. You know, you made sure you knocked off early for beers on a Friday with the boys and, you know, those things way back then. But in terms of, I don't know, training, you know, we're pretty pretty big on training our staff. Um, and so, you know, what got me to change? Well, it was mainly, um, I guess, a series of, we were talking about again in, in the interview I just did with you, Max, the, you know, challenges you know, low points or, or points at which, the, you know, the pain exceeds the, the benefit of staying in the same situation. And and so for me, what did that look like? It was, you know, kind of challenges with, um, I guess, behaviour, like in value lining. My, my, my behaviour was no longer congruent with my values um, and I didn't really know what values were. So, you know, doing some training and acknowledging what my values might have been, you know, actually writing them down for the first time, and then identifying that I just didn't, I didn't want to do that anymore. You know, I didn't want to see paddocks blown away in the wind. I didn't want to be feeding sheep and cattle all through the winter and the summer. I didn't want to, you know, uh, now knowingly put chemical on pasture and kill stuff, and and knowing what it's doing to the soil. You know, there's this, there's a lot that. And that that still develops today, you know, like just a greater understanding of, um, you know, environment, life, nature, and um, you know, and developing somewhat of a relationship with nature, you know, is 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 is, is, is important now. You know, before before nature was um, was a resource to to use to to, to grow, uh, produce a commodity to sell, you know. So so challenges along the way, you know, I, I, I got involved with a number of, you know, organisations. Um, RCS Australia, Resource Consulting Service Australia was the main one back then where they had a lot of training that I, I did. Um, the, the first touch point with them was a one-day course that they put on in town at Borowa called Profiting from the Drought. You know, it was a pretty interesting name to call it, a one-day course in the yeah. middle of the millennial drought, you know. Yeah. And um, that got that piqued my interest. So I went along, and and there was a, um, you know, that it 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 was it was a, we were in, it was in, it was a really good, you know, as they are, well facilitated course. And it wasn't about answers. It wasn't like oh, here's all the answers to, you know, change your business. It was more asking us questions to challenge our paradigms about what we were currently doing, which is really good. You know, mm. it wasn't prescriptive. Um, and so through the next, you know. Even now, you know, training in those areas and with those people and with those organisations and many others that, um, uh, you know, it feels much better to be um, not waking up every morning killing stuff. Yeah. Well, um, when you said that, and it's, it sounds like an amazing uh, ab- about or a, an opportunity of self-reflection that you engaged in where you wrote down your values and realised that what you were doing wasn't congruent with what you believed in. Uh, for some reason, I had a, an image of a, a doctor writing opioid prescriptions out, and then one day being like, "Hang on, um, don't want to do this. this. isn't This isn't what I'm about." So, um, g- give us a bit of an idea about how chemicals got into agriculture, because I, I, I talked recently to, to David Bushell, an agronomist, and he says the exact same thing that you did, which was in the past thirty years more and more chemicals were being used and they were having a, a declining effect. So whereas previously you would have sprayed one paddock with you know half a litre of glyphosate, um, you are now having to use four litres of glyphosate, but you'd have to do multiple applications. So where did chemicals arrive in this farming story and what were we doing before chemicals uh, had arrived? 
Well, way before, you know, chemicals, I mean, I guess, you know, let's just go back a couple hundred years um, when there was um, uh, there was agriculture, but it was it was much farming much more in sync with nature because we just didn't have the tools, we didn't have the machinery, didn't have the diesel and the, and the, and the petrol and whatever else, and just we was more based on manpower and and uh, and and also a rely or our intuitive the nature to work with nature and um, and you and partner partner with nature and so over a period of time when you know science evolved if we can we can call it that and the MPK theory sort of came to light with um, I can't remember the chap his name in about eighteen eighty somewhere there and there was a you know uh, well. You know, discovery, I, I, I suppose, that or, or or the theory that you know you, you you're lacking nitrogen, you put more nitrogen on, and you'll get a result. Now that kind of works, but not in a holistic sense. And so, you know, some decades of NPK theory and the use of of individual um, uh, nutrients elements uh, added to agriculture, which had an impact. But and and say in the case of nitrogen, you might apply nitrogen and in different forms and you get an immediate result. Mm. Looks, you know, it's bigger and greener. Wow, must be better. Well, not necessarily, you know. It, it's a reductionist approach, isn't it? Totally. That, that really reduces the complex, the biological complexity to a in, input-output. And when you said that, it, it reminds me of treating a type 2 diabetic with insulin. Um, when you d- deliver a dose of insulin, yes, you'll, you'll reduce their blood blood glucose level, but um, you're not doing anything for the underlying disease process, which is insulin resistance and the fact that they're eating a diet and they're in an environment that is making them insulin resistant. So you can inject all the insulin you want, but you're not doing anything to solve the underlying problem. So what you're, the MPK theory sounds like an analogy to, to what we're still doing in medicine. Very similar. You know, and we're still doing it in, in agriculture now, really, but in a different form. You know, that was a very simplistic form. Um, and then, I mean, we use biodynamics at, 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 ha- at you know, Hannah Minow on our farm and we teach biodynamics. And, you know, 1924, Rudolf Steiner was approached by um, European, mainly German and Austrian farmers saying, look, this MPK thing's kind of, we're, we're struggling with it because as the years went on and the application, this reductionist kind of way of growing food was applied to the land, then deficiencies were evolved and, um, uh, and, and imbalances and the biology was not really considered at all and, and not really understood, but it was kind of dismissed as being important. So Steiner put, pulled together a series of nine lectures and um, yeah, which was the, the foundation for, for biodynamics. And then fast forward to the Second World War, which wasn't that long after really, um, and the production of a whole lot of um, weapons uh, essentially and, and chemicals and um that were then um, uh, obsolete at the end of the war, you know, so they were a weapon against humans, mankind at the time, and then, um, you know, some, some, some scientists then decide, well, how can we use all this stuff, that use the, use the, 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 um, the knowledge and, and, and literally use the product up because they had a whole lot of it in storage. Um, how can we use this to kill other things? And so they, they developed um, herbicides, um, and pesticides to to roll out in agriculture, and thought that was a good idea. Mm-hmm. So that combined with, you know, the green revolution, which was really about you know a, a more advanced um, uh, phase of the MPK theory, um, combined with with the you know chemical use um, from you know the Second World War, so the fifties and sixties, and into the seventies. A bit, I mean, it, it sort of increased exponentially over that time to now. Because there's also the somewhat of a um, acknowledging that ploughing was probably not as good for the soil as was intended, and we now had the opportunity to kill the weeds instead of ploughing them in. So it was an interesting evolution of, if you can call that again, agriculture to a point. And now we, and as in our case, when we were we were using chemical, and and I dare I say, huge amounts of it now, um, more and more reliant, more complex, and 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 um, specific um, chemicals, the bases, they're all the same, you know, in essence from that, what they were decades ago, but they're just being tweaked. And back to your question about, you know, we need more. We need more because <clears throat> we're told we need more. We don't, not not every case I, I, I would hazard to say is not, is because we actually need more. It's more recommended, you know, safer. You know, I know it's, we can, we can, we can put more on because, you know, just to be safe and, 
Um, so there's that, let's just do a more chemical approach, but there's also, as in the case of glyphosate and glyphosate-resistant plants like ryegrass, um, there was a point, you know, at which you, you did need more to kill it because it was, resist it was resistant to the, you know, the lower dosages. And so the, you know, the more on um, uh, could have principle, you know, you just put more on <laughs> and it'll, and it'll, um, it'll kill it, you know, and that was the case. And now um, there's, you know, different um, cousins of, of, yeah, all, you know, chemicals have just expanded in terms of their, their specificity. Um, and, you know, you've got a chemical to kill every single thing now. So in, in a, on a, on a, on a farming sort of cropping um, situation, but, you know, as was the case with me, not appreciating the impact on soil. And, you know, soil is, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's physics and it's chemistry and it's biology. And it's a beautiful, you know, combination of those things that, that, that is, uh, and, and, and that creates good soil, creates um, vital, um, you know, fertile soil, well-structured soil, um, soil with greater holding capacity, um, and, a, and a more resilient soil structure. And, and, you know, when you apply chemicals and glyphosate, for example, um, it's a, it's a antibiotic basically, and it's, you know, it kills, it kills bacteria, you know, and it's, it, what it's doing to the soil is, is not dissimilar to what it does to us when we eat food that's, 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 you know, been grown with glyphosate and, and, um, it, it, it you know, destroys our gut lining and, and kills bacteria it's doing the same thing for us as it does the plants it's you know and and you know it's dare i say responsible for i don't know countless you know human d diseases or, or ailments in in humans and it continues to be a be a problem we were talking about atrazine before and you know tref, tref, treflan and all sorts of paraquat. you know some of these chemicals which we used I, i've used all those mm. um many years ago you know those things don't just disappear and dissolve or or break down in the soil once they sort of they've done their job and they've killed the plant and you know they stay there for god knows how long or i don't know god knows what their their their, their half-life is but they continue to impact um, not just the plants that they were you know sprayed on in the first place but they're in waterways they're in you know ddt's and every every human on the planet mm. um that stuff's not going away. Yeah, well, and, that, and that's a great opportunity to emphasise for the listener is that in the process of conducting uh, industrial agriculture, we're having this this side effect or this unintended consequence of corruption or, or contamination of the human food supply with chemicals that were intended to simply provide weed control for the crop but are now contaminating the food and then having direct adverse health outcomes for humans and you know we mentioned glyphosate we mentioned atrazine we mentioned paraquat and um, th these all have unique effects on human physiology uh, and biology in, in a negative way and i think that the reality or the perhaps the truth about the magnitude of harm is one that is not adequately being talked about for a number of reasons in the same way tobacco smoking and the risk of, of, of to human health was obfuscated by the tobacco industry for many years. Um, the It seems like the the economic power that is involved in industrial agriculture is doing their best to, again, create confusion and uh, obfuscate the, the link between the, the consumption or the exposure to these chemicals and adverse human effects. Well, there's, yeah, there's no money in health. Well, there's no money in in pure health and healthy human beings because they don't. There's no no need to rely on, you know, manufactured um, products, you know, and and, and so called health giving <laughs> medications and things. So, it's it was never going to be um, business was never going to put a whole lot of money into um, products or, or 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 initiatives which were going to um, not create profit for them. And yeah, and and in your experience, are you did you ever perform testing on your your crops, or did you, were you ever able to ascertain the degree to which you had contamination of the end product with the herbicides that you were spraying? No, no, I didn't even didn't bother. I didn't even think of it. Like I wasn't I wasn't thinking, you know, I'll spray that 
canola, say, and then test the test the canola that came off it. It was, you know, it was a commodity. It was a thing that I grew to make money and, you know, and that was not, it wasn't required of me to, to do that, to sell mm. it. It was just, you know, you, you, you take a truckload in or you might sell it, you know, um, uh, um, in advance, you know, and on contract, and you, as long as you met the the weight and the sort of the 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 um, some basic specs, um, which um, more about yield, um, nothing to do with all oh, the quality in terms of human health or, or whatever. Or the product. I mean, yeah, the product at all. I mean, canola is probably not the best one because, to, as an example, well, is in a way, but you know. Um, uh, <laughs> I mean, as we said in our interview I did with you, the Max Canola is, you know, um, a crop that is um, it's a monocrop for monocrop for the fir- in the first place um, requires a whole lot of preparation before, during, um, and in some in some cases post um, the the harvest of it, uh, and uh, so a lot of input, a lot of chemical application to control weeds and and pests and so on. And then um, the actual quality, the the product itself being a being a, an oil, um, is far from good for humans anyway. Mm. So we're spending a lot of time, money, and and risk as a farmer to produce something that. Um, back to your question, I, I didn't even think about the quality the quality of that and how it was impacting cattle um, in a, in sheep and a similar thing. Not thinking about the drench and the. I mean, they're all with they were withholding times that we had to. Um, adhere to in terms of before you can sell that animal, but I wasn't thinking about oh now that's got drenching it. What's that mean for the kids who are going to eat that chop? Mm. Uh, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, and you, and you made the comment. You made the comment that you wouldn't have baked, you wouldn't have eaten the loaf of bread that you baked with your own wheat, mm. uh, and that that reflects the fact that modern industrial farming is disconnected from the end product, the end consumer uh, that is being made with with that product and the fact that it, it, as you said it's treated as a commodity perhaps if that food was being given to you know the local primary school that your own children were attending and it was being made to feed them then we'd be thinking that that thought would be more present closer to mind which is like hang on what could be even possibly contaminating this crop um and and what if some of the glyphosate that i sprayed to desiccate this this crop was then getting into the food, so I, I feel like this is a, this is more of a comment on on society and the structure of the modern industrial agricultural setup is that that disconnect from that end person. There's no face um, is perhaps feeding into the apathy or the fact is oh, I'm just done my job, I'm delivered my 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 grain crop, I've made yield, I've made weight, um, don't want to know any more about it. Well, it's a quality thing, isn't it? Like you know. From a farmer's point of view, it's quantity of food, a quantity of wheat, canola, beef, whatever it is. Um, at the other end of that, the eaters are going, well, it's a quantity thing. I want, you know, I need five steaks or three steaks or bags of rice or whatever the, 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 the amount is. And, yes, you know, sometimes price indicates quality and so there may be, you know, they, they, they make that purchase based on price and therefore quality, but, you know, the, the the general eater punter is um, it, it, understandably it's a it's a it's an econo- economic thing. How much can I how, how far can I stretch my my budget this week? Um, the unfortunate thing is there's a lot of the stuff that is cheap is 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 cheap for a reason. It's 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 free. It's it's almost free of nutrients. You know where yeah. we have a world that's um, what do they say over over overfed and undernourished. Undernourished. You know so yeah. Uh, and as conventional farmers and as I was, you know. I was contributing to that somewhat, and but there's a gap, you know. I didn't appreciate, I didn't understand, I didn't, I wasn't prompted to even think about about that. You know, it was normal to spray a number of different chemicals on on canola or wheat, um, uh, or even on pasture to control so-called weeds, and then animals eat that. You know, that was a normal thing to do, and I wasn't going. Hang on, you know, how long does that chemical last on that wheat? Um, does you know what's it do to the the kids who who eat that bread that's baked from and made from that flour? You know, I wasn't even prompted to ask those questions, and I wasn't aware enough about my own health. And you know, it wasn't in the in the in the farming circles I was in. There wasn't talk about the quality of the food. There was a quality of like, oh, you got fourteen 
percent wheat, you know, you get a bit, you get more money for fourteen percent. Um, sorry, fourteen percent protein in your wheat. But in terms of what does that mean to the end user? No, it, total ignorant, ignorance, you know. And it was, it was, you know, as we were saying before, it's either uh, plenty of farmers who the only reason they asked questions was they had a health challenge, mm. whether it was their own personal one or a child or a wife or a husband or whatever that prompted them to go, oh, shit, you know, maybe I should be doing, you know, just just inquiring. Um, you know, it'd be, it'd be lovely if people change because of curiosity other than pain, but it's, you know, nine times out of ten, it's it's the pain that we have to go through, as we said, to get people to ask better questions and, you know, uh, but, 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 you know, if we can turn that pain into an opportunity or a lesson or a or a gift, you know, the, the gift of, 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 a, of an illness, if I can call it that, if that gets someone eating differently and, you know, they can save their own life and, and, then, and then ensure that they're, they're, the, the lives of their children and their family are going to be a hell of a lot better because they stop farming mm. chemically or they just cha- even just change the way they did things and, you know, if they just ask better questions of their agronomist about do I really need to spray this or even where they spray, give the house a buffer. I mean, there's so many ways that you can make a, a significant impact from a health point of view of your family and on your farm just by, you know, changing your attitude but also changing the, the operation of it. You yeah. Because I'm, I'm not expecting any farmer, if, you know, farmers listening to this and go, oh, you know, I'm not expecting anyone to just throw the chemical out tomorrow. You know, it, it's for me it's about, well, what, what can your budget handle? You know, where, how does your behaviour align with your values? And you know, what what if you want to, uh, if you have, you know, because it does take courage to do these things, absolutely. And you know, what can you change incrementally that you feel comfortable doing that you feel is moving you towards a, you know, a cleaner farm, a more healthy farm, a better nutrient dense food, yeah, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. And really, what I'm hearing, Charlie, is that it sounds like collectively we're using the wrong metrics and by that i mean in farming we're prioritizing 12 month income yield from that field um how, how much tonnage of of grain we're producing uh in in animal agriculture we're, we're pricing how much that will cow will weigh in the shortest amount of time um, and in medicine perhaps we're we're as i gave the the idea of the, the diabetic we're just blindly looking at um blood blood sugar and accepting uh glycemic hba1 targets you know higher than we need to because we're just using the wrong metrics and for a variety of reasons we're using these wrong metrics but it really sets a, a low bar and it, and it, again it isn't prompting us to ask the 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 right questions and then to to them therefore do better the interesting i think and the, and the really glaring corollary of, of what we've talked about is that what what do we do collectively if we're not um spraying heaps of heaps of um, pesticides and the, this the narrative that i think is in the mainstream which is that we need to be using crop monocropping we need to use genetically modified uh, you know versions of rice that contain beta carotenoids for, for to feed the world how are we going to feed the world there's a there's this uh, i feel like there's a uh, and maybe I, I'm sounding biased by by even posing the question in this way, but there seems to me to be a pre preoccupation about this massive global scale of thought, and no one is saying, oh, "What about my backyard? How do we feed the people in my local community?" It's always the default is this massive global scale, and therefore that when when the question's posed like that, the answer is, "Oh, monocropping and and herbicides and glyphosate." So, how do you think about that question of how do we feed everyone? Well, I go. Well, I guess the first thing I think about or emphasise is, you know, seventy percent of the food produced in the world is is produced on farms five acres or less, and eighty percent is on ten acres or less. So we can actually do it. You know, it, it's being done. And sure, that's not in Australia and the US potentially, but there's a huge amount in the, in Europe. You know, that's just the way they they do they do it, um, and elsewhere, Asia, and uh, so. It, yeah, you know, the the real problem, as I understand it, is it's it's a much it's not so much about um, quantity or, or or how much has been produced, um, and 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 not even so much about the it's in some degrees quality, but it's more about the the you know the distribution, how we're getting it. There's no there's no there's enough food that's grown in the world if we just look at volume to feed the world, 
And so, you know, because most of the people who are talking about pose those questions about how we're going to feed the world, they're not worried about quality, they're worried about quantity. So we can answer the, quor- quor- qual- the quantity thing pretty easily. It's like there's actually enough out there, it's just not getting to the right people. So put that one aside. The quality thing is something they generally don't go there on. Um, now, yes, you know, so we've got a, you know, and this sort of, I guess, wades into the whole vegan sort of debate, you know, that if we're going to save the planet, uh, and this is the combination of a, a climate change or a you know changing climate um, uh, conversation with food production and human health and the health of the environment. I mean, it's, it, you know, there's a, a, an emphasis on, well, if we're going to feed the planet, we need a monoculture, and that's handy because, you know, to monoculture you can't have, you shouldn't have animals because animals are farting and burping and killing the planet anyway. So let's just monoculture everything. We'll be able to feed all the people and do it in a way that's going to save the planet. You know, there couldn't be anything further from the truth, as we both know uh, or understand it to be. And, um, you know, you are, simply ask questions around, well, what, you know, because for that whole monoculture plant versus animal diet, you know, it comes down to um, three general things. You know, it's it's nutrition of, you know, comparing nutrition profile, let's just say. Um, there's the ethics of it, you know, which is pretty subjective. And then there's the environmental impact of it. So putting the ethics aside because that's a personal choice and you're never going to change anyone's mind about that. Um, directly looking at ethics, but you might be able to if you if you look at the environmental and the nutritional components of that whole that whole um, argument. So you know, um, monoculture it requires large tracts of land that that are a lot of it you know um, isn't suitable for monoculture anyway or cropping, and that's that's one of the biggest you know sort of furfies about you know are we you know move the cows off and put the soybeans in well it doesn't it's not that simple and if even if they were to be able to swap that out you know they're going to use huge amounts of chemical to do it because no one's talking about doing it naturally you go we just go to monoculture and you know then that does sort of venture into the ethics of it a bit is like well, what's the value of life you know a sentient creature is a mouse you know more or less expendable than a than a than a um uh, a cow um uh you know, many more animals. I would suggest are killed in all the different forms in a acre on an acre of monocrop um, corn in the US than 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 sort of a equivalent amount of uh, energy or protein or nutrients um, uh, in a grazing situation. I mean, this is a, such a big conversation. It's a isn't deep, it? isn't it? And look, it it really makes me think. Uh, about there's a whole podcast series right there yeah yeah it isn't it but it's baffling to me that people uh accepted the idea that eating a plant-based diet that's sourcing or based on things like chickpeas that have been grown in a monoculture Mm. had glyphosate sprayed on them to desiccate them and kill them before they could be harvested that um that is somehow superior to to um, a holistic a grazing operation that is regenerating the soil that the animals are treated ethically so i think that the the narrative about the superiority of of plant-based diet from an environmental point of view very much relies on ignorance and a disconnect oh. of that end consumer from the reality of how that that crop crop was raised and they want that you know the, the those who are selling that chickpea and whatever and saying that's going to save the planet and feed the feed the, the world they rely on ignorance to to, mm. to sell that because you know it's the, it's one of the many great you pull you pull the curtain aside on that one, uh, which is easy to do, but no one's watching. You know they don't. It doesn't <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't serve them to actually because to, to, it, it's a it's a real challenge. Yeah, you know, like I I, I know I mentioned it before, but it's worth saying again that you know the there's Matt Evans wrote wrote, wrote, a, wrote a great book called On Eating Meat, and um, it's he talks about, and he in a very diplomatic, you know, balanced, measured way about the pros and cons, and and you know, um, him being a farmer down in Tasmania and, and growing, you know, lots of protein and animals and and so on. So he talks about, you know, the that um, uh, you know the 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 animals and and death and suffering, and if 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 the ethical side of the argument is around suffering, um. The biggest impact that let's just 
keep it in Australia because it's sort of Australian stats, so to speak. The biggest impact that anyone can make in Australia to reduce suffering, if that's what we're talking about, um, as a general thing, if if yeah, a mouse has the same value as a cow in terms of you know feelings sentience. and sentience, then the biggest impact we can possibly have in reducing suffering is the removal of feral cats from 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 nature from Australia. I mean, I'm saying Australia because there are feral cats in the US and in Europe, because every night of the of the of the year, hundreds of thousands of animals are tortured, not just die and and but tortured and then. And then and, and 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 are killed. Some are eaten and some are not. Um, and so, that's a pretty big tally of suffering every night, right? Uh, and there's wild dogs and there's all. But let's just stick to the, the 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 felines for a minute. So that being said, it would make sense that efforts should be put into the eradication of cats from the environment. That would have the biggest impact on suffering, which I think is I don't think anyone can deny. That be that wouldn't be a bad thing. Right, so let's focus on that and stop putting bullshit, you know, footage up of 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 cow, you know, cattle in Indonesia. And some of it may have been true, and some of it may have been set up. I don't know, but the 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 impact on the industry and on people and and of of, of that sort of like, oh, let's go, oh, Taranaki Farm in Victoria a couple of years ago. I, I understand that they do an amazing job of of having you know chickens free ranging and for egg production. Some couple of bright sparks decide they release the chickens from their from their from their um, you know um, confinement and what happened they got, like hundreds of them got mowed down that night and subsequent nights by foxes right so they didn't avoid any suffering there so you know if, if those efforts went into this, this cat thing get rid of the cats we'd have a real impact right mm. on suffering mm. and my you know and then I'm, I'm actually hankering to talk to some people who you know would prefer everyone not eat meat um, and ask them if in, if they've got cats in their in their house or even dogs, you know. And so, because because they're because they're cute and fluffy, we can't sort of you know we, we we can't go there about well if we got not I'm not I mean domestic cats have their issues as well. But let's just start with the feral cats. But you know, are those people are they are they what are they feeding those cats? Is it meat? Yeah, where did the meat come from? Where the meat come from? So that's yeah. that's that's sort of hypocritical if they if they're feeding the meat, yeah. and if they're not, well, they feeding them a cereal based food probably, which is killing them. Yeah, which is not ethical for not ethical either for, for the reason that you, you're not respecting the animal's natural um, procliv- proclivities and needs as a as a, as a, as a carnivore. carnivore. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, there's so many holes that we can poke. In, oh, I know, I know. In, I, in, in the in the plant based narrative. Yeah. Um. But yeah, that's a very interesting set of of explanations. And look, uh, uh, just on an, on an aside, and and again, not to just to, to cap off the discussion about herbicides, I strongly suspect that one of the main benefits that people get when they do a carnivore based diet, animal based or carnivore diet, is that they're simply not ingesting. Uh, a whole range of herbicidal contaminants. Yeah. And I'm really looking forward to talking to some more people who are at the interface of uh, of uh, testing food for residue because I think that will be really instrumental in, in helping us understand a bit a bit more. So well if I can yeah if I can some find some correlations between, you know, chemical residue, it's in plants or or or, or meat. Um and and health and different markers. I, I think there's I mean I'm is that is that not happen, is that not been done yet? Well, we know we know that mechanistically, um, glyphosate is involved in development of of can be associated with development of fatty liver disease. Um, as you mentioned, it disrupts mi- the microbial activity. It kills plants by inhibiting the shikimate pathway, which occurs in bacteria, and that's one reason why it screws up our our microflora. So um, I guess uh, that that's that is known, but. Um, to maybe have some data about exactly what people are getting from the supermarket and how much glyphosate is in that would would be very very interesting. And so so give us a bit of insight now into the techniques that you're using, both from an animal agriculture and a cropping point of view, that have allowed you to free yourself from this addiction to to chemical inputs. We're not doing we're not doing any crop, cropping anymore, and I guess the, the the reason we stopped cropping many years ago was that you know. I, there was I didn't see how we could continue cropping and just drop chemical out. Yeah, you know we think that year we stopped growing, we stopped using chemical. It was about mid season. I still had crops to harvest and so on, but I just I couldn't bring myself to 
do that last spray of whatever spray on them <laughs> for the thing. I just let them, you know, finish up and we finished cropping that year. We sold our gear and I just didn't want to, I, I just, it would felt, it didn't feel right to sort of, um, uh, you know, knowing, if, you know, I was thinking about, you know, family and children and life in the future and I, I didn't see chemical had a part, a part of that in, in, in that cropping sense. So we, the, the, well, really, all we do now in a cropping sense is we do some multi-species pasture cropping, which is you know, allows us to, with varying degrees of success, we're still experimenting, um, um, sow seeds in, in 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 existing pasture to increase biology and and, and biodiversity. Um, we use biodynamics in in our pasture and in in those sort of multi-species pasture cropping situations yeah. um, as well. We have made compost and spread that on paddocks. Um, we use other um, liquid, um, uh, you know, um, dare I say, fertilizers like worm, worm wee. We make our own. We make seaweed brews. We do all sorts of different brews. We mix with biodynamics and and put that out there. Um, so and then animal husbandry. You know, we we stopped vaccinating. I don't know years ago. I just sort of stopped doing it, and I can't remember there being any big issues with that. We've had some um, challenges in the last year or so just with trade cattle coming in, buying trade cattle and, and not having probably a tight enough biosecurity sort of system and induction. Um, so we have had to, I don't know if we do, we vaccinate. Oh, we did vaccinate just a, a couple of specific things, but it was very, um, very specific and, and sort of in a, with, with you know, advice from, from conventional and, and alternative vets, you know, just sort of get our hand like didn't want to do things unnecessarily. It wasn't just like, oh, we're just going to jump straight back into the conventional um, animal management. So, but we found with, you know, as an example with drenching, like cattle, cattle, you know, um, and, and their worm burden, if you give them the opportunity to, to build resistance, um, they will in their, their sort of, you know, after a couple of years, you know, when you when you graze them in a way that they're not eating right to the ground, when they've got plenty of good nutritious food, if 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 they've got a, a diverse range of food, so it's a smorgasbord, not like a one or two different things in a paddock, like a monocultured sort of thing. Um, so diversity of, of their food, um, uh, husbandry in the way we move them, as I mentioned before, in a way that is is respective uh, respectful of their of their natural tendencies to move and not move um supplements we do give them like sulfur and copper and and um bentonite um salt himalayan rock salt um sounds cool mate. yeah it's pretty cool mate well <laughs> i guess you you know you sort of acknowledging that we that that animals have different nutrient profiles or requirements through the year um sheep and even between you know between species and within species um giving them the the opportunity to self-medicate you know um uh and and acknowledging their innate wisdoms um that's from a pasture point of view so give them as much as you possibly can in terms of a biodiverse pasture and they will they'll work out what they need whether they're lactating or or not or you know the 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 different requirements so yeah so there's animal yeah animal sort of um uh nutritional kind of things some are some are given and some are just um created through through improving um soil and better pasture more diverse pasture um and the cropping not doing the cropping anymore um things like just planting trees and giving them more shelter and giving mm. them giving them the ability to browse sometimes too you yeah. know like they they know when they they you know if they get access to wattle and things which has got those tannins and that helps to to reduce you know even worms and things in the world of biodynamics we 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 know that it on the full moon um you is a better chance of 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 um, reducing worm burden, whether that's with a conventional drench or with a natural drench, because um, that's what they they tend to detach from the the gut wall at that time of the month, and so just understanding this, the the cycles of nature um, somewhat more. Um, and there are times of the the day, and times of the week, and times of the month, and times of the year when uh, um, uh, spraying biodynamics in its various sort of forms. Um, will be more effective. Yeah. You know? So yeah. there's lots of different ways. We, um, having said all that, though, Max, you know, we're not the model farmer. You know, we're, we're, I'm not saying that. Oh, you know, this is our recipe and this is how you do it. I think the one message is that for everyone to kind of take home at least is 
you know, we always advocate adaption. You know, it's not like, oh, here's your recipe. Um, this is what you do this time of the day or the month of the year and whatever. It's you've got to, you know, don't advocate your your decision making and that responsibility to to other people. Yeah. You know, yeah. get get advice, digest it, make sure it fits with your budget, make sure it fits with your, you know, your values. Um, ask questions, read books, um, go to courses and 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 just kind of develop the skill of, of of working at what feels good you know like what what fits and and um and there's also yeah you, know, you can venture into the world of subtle energy as well and dowsing and kind of you know helping that 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 helps you know um navigate decision making sometimes or just sort of getting in tune with your intuition about about things you know whether that's the paddock to put sheep into or the the supplement to give cattle or whatever it happens to be so you know it's pretty exciting when you when you i mean nowadays we can google you know but it's pretty exciting when you get a few prompts and you sort of feel a bit curious about what else can be done and it does just because you read something doesn't mean you should go and do it or if someone is working for someone else yeah um yeah. or i talk here about i don't know whatever um it, it's you know, it's not prescriptive. It's, yeah. it's really, really about finding what, what, what works. feels and looks good. Yeah, do your own research uh, as always. Totally. And um, it's, it's fascinating how deep the rabbit hole can go when, we, again, we use the holistic biosphere um, environmental health as the goal rather than those short-term metrics like how much yield can I can I squeeze out of my land? Um, I'm, I'm mindful of time, Charlie, and, mm. and this is, a, I think, maybe a, a great opportunity to give the listener a bit of a, an idea about another one of your passions and life work, which is your podcast. Yeah. So you've obviously talked to a lot of regenerative farmers. Um, you, you would have learned a heap of, of how people are, uh, are doing are doing different things. So just get, give a bit of an overview of the podcast and perhaps some of the key key or most interesting things that you've learned from talking to other regenerative farmers. Yeah. Um, so it's called the regenerative journey. Um, I started three years ago with the intention of um, it was really around the first seasons around farming and 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 yeah, food. I guess that that very close connection. Uh, but as I interviewed people, it quickly developed into and I started appreciating that. Food, farming, human, and environmental health are all intertwined, um, and so I broadened the the sort of the, the guests, and I've interviewed um, doctors and actors and actresses and and um, dentists and um, nutritionists and um, all sorts of different. You know, my my yeah, my, my scope of who I interview is, is is gets broader, and I guess so. That's that's interesting, and that's that's. I guess quite reassuring that you can't have a conversation with someone and not be drawn back to those those couple of topics. Um, uh, in terms of the regenerative farmers, I mean, fascinating, amazing, courageous, curious people who you know some of them are pioneers in in that style of farming in Australia or, um, or internationally. Joel Salatin was um, he was in my first series. He's you know quite has been the world's best farmer and really fascinating guy, lovely bloke. Um, over there in Virginia, um, uh, Charlie Massey, who wrote Call of the Rewarb, or I might have referenced um, in, in an interview we did, a um, uh, sheep farmer who interviewed a whole lot of farmers and, and, and sort of you know, identified these tension events, these challenges that force push people into different ways of farming. Um, look, I guess, you know, again, I mentioned before the, the adaption is a, is a message. Um, working closer with nature often it's often what you stop doing than 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 what you start doing like if you if you yeah which is kind of good isn't it like if you that's a nice way to transition if you just stop doing things it's not as though you have to put more on your plate or fill your diet with more things sometimes you know if you like one thing is you stop worrying about things out of your control um in some cases like in animals you know in our case we stopped you know, essentially drenching and vaccinating. Um, I'm not saying everyone should go and do that, but I'm saying that was interesting because I really said, why am I doing this just methodically every month or every week, mm -hmm. every, you know, it was just like I really challenged the paradigm of, oh, you need to do this, you know. Um, what else? Um, so, yeah, not, not, not 
uh, oh, eighty percent of something's better than one hundred percent of nothing. Yeah, I love that one. Yeah, yeah, I just think you know we often get caught up in the detail and the fear of change, and and this is fine. I'm not criticizing anyone who, who does get caught up. I I I haven't, you know, I still do somewhat. But giving it a shot, having having yeah, experiment, something that came came up a couple of months ago, in a very short period of time, you know, the universe was telling me, you know, in 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 the period of a, a day, I from three different sort of avenues that we were, there was this I think I was being told to experiment you know and that's really that's really important you know yeah. that you don't you know just keeping your mind open to different things um not spending your life going in circles just trying every single thing you've got to sort of settle on something but I think the you know the experimentation is a is a really important thing to to keep um I mean there's there's, there's there, I guess there's there's a whole hour or two of all those experiences and things but I you know um I just think that the the, the people who are courageous and they've made changes, it's generally been through pain and they are so much better for it. Yeah. And the analogy that those two points that you made are, are equally applicable to making lifestyle changes as individuals and humans and patients, which is um, removing some of these habits, you know, stop eating the processed food. That's a, that's a big one. You know, stop oh. looking at your iPad at 9 PM in night, stop putting your phone by your bed like that. that those are the so, such important things and they don't involve, they just involve stopping, removing a, a behavior that's obviously impacting health. And again, 80% of, you know, walking, going for a walk, you don't have to start sprinting. Just go for a walk mm. after you eat is better than just sitting on the couch. So, uh, yeah, we could we could talk for hours about the analogies between human health and agriculture, and I think they so elegantly uh, intertwine. Uh, before I let you go, I want to do a quick plug about the Ingunis, uh, Inguni cattle breed. We talked about them a bit before. Um, I've got a book here that uh, uh, someone who I interviewed, Ed Rouse, recently, he's an Inguni breeder. Um, he gave me this copy of the Inguni of the Marcatini Flats, and uh, they're incredible, interesting African cattle breed. Mm. So uh, that Jake Wilkie's running, Brian East, uh, Brian Usher from East Wheel Farms is running. Um, and yeah, I'm wondering, you have, have you heard of them? Yeah, certainly heard of them. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know as much about them as I feel I need to now. Yeah. But um, yeah, no, I certainly appreciate that they're very resilient breed. Um, and as you said, there's not that many sort of pure breeds. Um, in the country, uh, so I think it's yeah. Good hats off to the people who are who are you know um, focusing on on them, and you know that's that's what we need. We need easy doing, easy, low maintenance cattle that are you know have good quality um, meat qualities and 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 as docile as one can be, and also they've got horns, so that's always a good thing. Mm. Um, generally healthier than the polled animals, and the ones that can deal with you know our Australian in cl- our Australian climate and the, and the and the variation in a year and you know across the whole nation and I think it's it's great yeah and bring uh, them on yeah interesting I I talked to Edwin Rouse about them and he mentioned that the act of not drenching uh, the, these animals meant that he had a higher amount of dung beetles mm. in the actual dung of the animal yeah. so that the their ability to regenerate the land that their, their use as a tool of land regeneration is amplified when we mimic their natural habitat when we don't use chemical inputs mm. um, so it's a it's a fascinating uh, synthesis and integration of everything so Fantastic. Um, can I give a plug to something weird please, please 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 um, Max in uh, I'm not sure when this is going out but towards the middle of July um, we are no hang on middle of August I should say middle of August we're we're launching a, uh, a webinar series called your regenerative journey okay um, it's over eight weeks we've got um, Katie Zerner from RCS doing uh, visions and goals Sheree Goodings doing animal husbandry great um, Brian Warburg's doing talking about um, uh, plant Plant um, plant growth and grazing. Um, we have got um, Nicole Masters talking about soil. Uh, Stuart um, Andrews is talking about uh, hydrology and landscape function and regenerative agriculture. Um, and uh, Cindy O'Meara is going to be talking about nutrition and human health and the, in the interface. And then Kim Deans is talking about farm finances. So I know a lot of your listeners are probably more medically inclined and not necessarily farming and so on, but. I guess, you know, I encourage everyone to jump on these sort of things because of our connection with food and farming and human health, environmental health. These seven people are experts in their field 
Um, and it's, I, I think it's, you know, it might sound like it's a farming kind of thing, but in terms of what you learn, it's so much more than, you know, operational on-farm practices. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to, that culminates in a farm tour at Hennemino at Burua, our farm on the 13th of October, it's a Friday, so we'll be having a feast and a, a good feed and a look around the farm and some more presentations there. So, Wow, sounds tremendous. Well, I'll include that information in the show notes. Awesome. Um, and what? El- how else can people get in touch or find find out about what you're doing? Yes, Max, um, charliearnett.com.au. Just go to our website. We've got events there. We've got biodynamic workshops coming up for the rest of the year. Jump on there if you want to learn more about that. Um on Instagram, uh, what else? Yeah, that's they're the main sort of things that we're up to at the moment. But um, yeah, feel free if you just want to jump jump on our newsletter, um, please do that. Sign up on the website, um, subscribe to the Regenerative Journey. It's on all your favourite podcast platforms, and that's probably fantastic. Well, Charlie, thank you so much, Max. Absolute awesome, pleasure. thank you. It's lovely yeah, to spend yeah. hours with you yeah, here yeah. in your home. It's yeah. been fantastic. Thanks for the chat. Great. All right. We'll uh, talk again.